All right, I'm gonna share my screen and just go through some of the course notes. All right, uh, in, the, in the last lecture, we, we looked at lightning performance. Um, there were two aspects to lightning performance. The first was shielding and shielding failure. And the other was um, the um, backflash over aspect where lightning strikes would hit a shield wire or a tower and then travel down to earth and cause a voltage or a potential rise. Um, that potential rise could be high enough to cause flashover from the tower to the to the phase conductor. So we'll explore that a little bit more today. Um, again, have a look at that probability. That probability equation is the probability of a lightning current occurring in excess of IP is given by P equal to what's given. All right, let's let's go down. Um, I didn't receive many questions about that. The example one. Uh, the only question I received was, sir, tell me how to do this. I, I can't answer that. It needs to be a question. All right. Um, so back flash over. I'm going to change to my um, iPad for this and draw out some of the aspects of it. All right. So we have a transmission tower. The transmission tower has an earth line and it's got three phases. So we're just going to look at phase one. So that earth tower itself, um, it is not just placed on the ground. Um, it has to have a strong kind of civil or structural um, properties. So in fact, the legs of that tower are have some sort of concrete foundation. That's what keeps it stable. So the metal runs from the top of the tower all the way into the ground. Right. Okay. So what happens? Um, a lightning strikes here with a very high current. Um, it is a metal structure. So if it's a metal structure, it's almost like a conductor. So that current goes down. You know that it's a metal structure, so it's going to have some sort of impedance. Right. So if it's got an impedance, it's got a voltage. So we we spoke a little bit about the foundations of this tower. So I've drawn an earth plane a little bit further away from the tower because that's actually what happens. Um, 
the better the connection with Earth, um, the better the current is transferred into the Earth. So, in fact, that foundation, whatever's in Earth, has a resistance. They call that the Earth or ground or tower or footing resistance. Could be tower footing. Etc. Right. So we know from electromagnetic theory, when you have a traveling wave, remember um, your waveform could be a 10 by 350 or so, or a 10 by 75. It's a traveling wave, it's not a sinusoid. When it hits a different impedance, some of it is actually reflected. Right. Okay. So, number one. The impedance of the tower causes an overvoltage. The, the reflected current causes another overvoltage. When that voltage is, is high enough, you have your phase conductor there on the left. If this voltage is high enough, then you, or the difference in voltage is high enough, you're going to get a a flash over across here. So it flashes from the tower to the phase conductor. Let me draw it in black because this is a bit of a dark color. Blue. Why that's important is because that flashover actually causes a short circuit from the phase to the to the tower. Um, so that causes your protection to trip. So that back flashover is is very bad for your power system. If your power trips, um, then it takes out basically your whole line. So you don't want that. So we can draw this a little bit more electrically. There's your tower impedance. Sorry. So there's your earth impedance, there's your tower impedance. There's your current source. Right. And there's your voltage developed. I'm sure you guys did reflection diagrams in EM theory. Thumbs up would do if you did. If you didn't, no stress because we're not going to do them here. All right, so, so that's the basic principle of back flashover. Um, so a lightning stri strikes a, an earthed conductor or an earth tower. The current runs down, causes some sort of reflections. A, de a voltage develops between the tower and the phase conductor. When it flashes over, um, if the voltage is high enough, it, it causes protection trip. So that's, that's the concept of a back flashover.
All right. Um, in the course notes, equation nine is your reflection coefficient. And let's just look at that a little bit. It's equation nine. Right, let's just call Z2RT, Z1 the tower. Right, so let's say that RT tends towards infinity, a very high number. Right, so your reflection coefficient tends towards one, which means everything is reflected from that current. So that means your voltage doubles. Right. RT tends towards naught. Right, your reflection coefficient tends to minus one. So your voltage does not double. So at minus one, all your current gets synced into the to the earth um, correctly. So this this little calculation, it's just going to show you that. Um, the lower your tower earthing resistance, the better the performance of the line. So we'll see that when you go through the course notes. All right, I'm just going to switch back to the um, the screen. Right, so the equation there, the reflection and transmission coefficients, um, you can see them there, that was equation nine. Right, the initial voltage at the top of the tower, um, Remember that the tower is one aspect, so that's ZT, but we also have a, an earth line connected. Um, so U naught equal to I of T to one over ZT, that's the impedance of the tower, um, plus two times ZS. So ZS is the characteristic impedance of the earth line. Um, and the reason it is two is because the current splits at the top there. Again, this is described in the video notes, so you can go through those a little bit later. Um, the time before the um, current propagates to the bottom, it's given by uh, tau equal to h, which is the height of the tower, divided by um, V, which is the propagation velocity. So it's somewhat close to the, prop, the velocity of the speed of light. So your voltage across your insulator string, described a little bit of that already. Um, so it would be the voltage of the tower plus your 50 hertz voltage. Remember that the phase has a 50 hertz voltage minus the um, 
the reflected component. All right, can we come to something called the vault time curve? Um, the vault time curve for impulse flashover is given by u of t equal to 400 plus 710 divided by t to the power of 0.75 times w. Right, so t is the time to flash over and w is the insulator length. So let's let's have a look at that plot quickly. I'm just going to swap screens again. All right, so there's our equation there. That's the volt time curve. Um, so what you see here is that um, the voltage would look something like that. So this is the voltage. So that's the flash over voltage. That's U of T. If we look at our equation here, the longer the time of the applied voltage, the lower the flash over voltage, right? The shorter the time, the higher the flash over voltage. Right, so, so that means if we apply a voltage of VA for time of TA, then flashover will occur. So what this is saying is that if the voltage is low-ish, then you need to apply a longer time for flashover to occur. That, that makes sense. If you apply a very high voltage, then flashover will occur at a much shorter time. So it's stressed for less time, so it requires a higher voltage to flash over. Whereas if you look at VATA, it's stressed for a much longer time, so it requires a lower voltage. Right, that kind of makes sense if you think about your probabilities that we looked at earlier on. Um, if you consider the streamer mechanism, etc., you need something to initiate the, the avalanche and it needs to be sustained over an entire gap. So if it's stressed for longer, a lower voltage, if it's stressed higher, it, it needs a short, well, stressed for a shorter time, it needs a higher voltage. The other aspect here, is your W, that's the length of your insulator. So um, if your insulator is longer,
right? So if, if your length is longer, you need more, you need a higher voltage to cause flashover. Right? That, that also makes sense because shorter gaps require shorter, lower breakdown voltages. All right, that, that brings us to example two. So after this lecture, what I want you to do is go through the video notes, the end of the video notes, and go on to example two and work through that. Again, um, you need to send me questions before the next lecture and I can answer them in the lecture. Um, I had a couple of questions last week, but they weren't really questions. They were just, there was no working or anything like that. If, if you've got a question, provide some working, ask a specific question, and I can answer it in the next lecture. Sorry, I need to share that screen. Right, so, so as I said, um, have a look at example two in the video notes, work through that, um, and then come back to me with questions for the next lecture. Switching performance, um, as we said at the beginning of this section, um, switching performance is really important for your higher voltage lines, so your 200 kV and above. Um, so switching surges, they characteristically have a lower peak amplitude, but greater energy than lightning surges. Um, so if we just remember the waveforms, a lightning vo over voltage is 1.2 by 50, whereas your switching over voltage is 250 by 2,500 microseconds. So it stresses your, your insulation for a longer duration of time. And that's what causes a problem. So they are caused by closing and reclosing of a transmission line. Um, you'll recall from power systems that your transmission line has resistance, capacitance, and inductance. Um, so switching um, onto a discharged capacitance with the naught volts, what does it do? It wants to charge it up, um, and it'll do that. Your inductance would, would oppose any sudden flow of current, so it causes a whole bunch of transients that are are um, that cause these over voltages. So switching of capacitive currents, um, often what happens in power systems is that you have capacitive banks. Um, the capacitive banks are, are switched into a transmission system when uh, it's heavily loaded and inductive and that helps correct the phase. So you get better power transfer. Um, but that that means that you're switching in a capacitive current and that could cause an overvoltage. Switching of inductive current. So transformers and shunt reactors on your power system. Um, when you load or unload them, they they are inductive, they cause an inrush, that could cause an overvoltage as well. And then if if there is a fault. Um, when you switch out or you switch back in, you do cause an over voltage as well. So we, we looked a little bit at, at reflections for the back flash over, but similarly with the transmission line, the big stuff, you've got mismatched impedances all over the place. And that can cause reflections of, of over voltages and that can lead to, to a higher um, switching surge over voltage than, than you expect. Right, there is a switching impulse strength of air gaps. It's given as a V50 or a U50. Um, and that's um, K into 3,400 divided by one plus eight divided by D, where D is your insulation length insulation length or, or gap fact or gap distance. Um, stick with gap distance so you can recognize the D. 
And then table two shows your gap factor. So that's the K in that equation. Right, and then the last thing I'll do today is just have a look at these gap factors and I'll try and share my iPad again. Right, so we had five different gap factors there. Um, and we'll go through each of them. So this is called a rod plane. The second one is the rod, rod, vertical. You get the rod. Horizontal. And the last two, we get a Conductor structure. And a conductor plane. Now those K factors are determined um, empirically with many labs across the world, and they're given in the note there. So in a, in a question in an ex exam or test, I, I would give, it has to be this type of structure, and you just need to look up in the table. Or I'd give you the actual gap factor. All right, uh, that's, that's it for today. Um, then again, if you've got questions, send them through. Um, and I can try and answer them in the lecture on Thursday. Okay, cool. Thanks for attending.